Welcome to this special edition of our virtual Lunch and Learn hosted by the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government Public Affairs and the Grace E. Harris Leadership Institute at VCU. My name is James Wazalewski and I'm the Director of Development for the Wilder School. Thank you so much for your time today and thank you for joining us. Our session today will feature guest speakers, Dr. Eugene Trani, President Emeritus and University Distinguished Professor at VCU, and Dr. John Kneebone, Associate Professor Emeritus of History at VCU, as well as our moderator, Mr. John Almschneider, Dean Emeritus of VCU Libraries, for introduction and discussion about their new book, Fulfilling the Promise, Virginia Commonwealth University and the City of Richmond, 1968 to 2009. As a reminder, we are recording the session as well as a question and answer portion. This includes comments in the chat. We are pleased to have each of you here for our session as we continue our efforts to engage and involve our alumni and our community. At this time, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Susan Gooden, Dean and Professor at the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. Dean Gooden. Thank you so much, James, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure uh, to welcome you to a special edition of our Wilder School Virtual Alumni Lunch and Learn. We started this series um, shortly after that the pandemic started as a way to strengthen our engagement with the community and to provide a forum to provide some of the uh, some, some really great insights um, and education and information on some contemporary topics that are facing our community at this time. And so I am delighted to have with us this afternoon, President Trani and Dr. Kneebone to discuss their new book. And I know that we will all enjoy it. I have read it and it is an outstanding work that really does a great job of talking about the story of VCU and its relationship to the city of Richmond and, all, and many of the nuances and important decisions along the way. The L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs is a nationally ranked school of public affairs. We are proud to be in the top 20% of all nationally ranked programs. And the work that we are doing has always been important, but it is particularly important uh, in today's time. When we think about the work of pu public service and good government, um, all of the majors within the Wilder School, whether we're talking about criminal justice, homeland security and emergency preparedness, urban and regional planning, public administration or public policy, all of these have very important implications to our work today. And so we're really proud of the work that we do and the work that we do in trying to fostering, uh, trying to foster a more equitable society. President Trani, of course, is the fourth president of VCU. And I had the honor of being hired at VCU when, when Trani was president. Um, as many of you may know, Dr. Harris was provost uh, under Dr when Dr. Trani was uh, president. And uh, the Gracie Harris Leadership Institute, we are working collaboratively with you today in, in uh, bringing this program. The Gracie Harris Leadership Institute is a division of the Wilder School. And I'm proud to introduce to you the director of the Gracie Harris Leadership Institute, Dr. Nakina Douglas Glenn. Thank you, Dean Gooden, for extending the invitation to partner with you on this event today. Greetings on behalf of the Gracie Harris Leadership Institute. I am delighted to join you this afternoon. We are excited to serve as a co-host for this event for many reasons. This is an important event for us as we celebrate the kickoff of the 20th class of the VCU Leadership Development Program, the flagship program of the Gracie Harris Leadership Institute. Established in 1999, the Gracie Harris Leadership Institute was developed to model the exemplary leadership legacy left behind by Dr. Grace Harris in her nearly 50 years of service to the university. With us today, we have 35 members of the 2021 cohort who will join the ranks of the more than 500 faculty, staff, and administrators across the university and the health system who have graduated from this prestigious program. This week has been a moment of reflection of the past and anticipation of the future. And today we reflect on the history much closer to home as we take stock of how our own leadership narrative fits into the fabric of the university's legacy. How we make our dreams real and the dreams of those around us to fulfill the promise of VCU. In support of this, we have added this book as a featured experience into our leadership program so that every participant in our current and future cohorts understand the rich history of VCU as a foundation for their leadership growth at this institution. 
And now I would like to turn it over and introduce you to our keynote moderator speaker today, Dr. Um, John Almschneider. John Olmschneider retired as Dean and University Librarian for VCU in July, 2020. During his nearly 21 years as VCU's Chief Librarian, VCU libraries evolved into a nationally recognized research library system, helping power the growth and stature of VCU as a whole. He is proud to join two other distinguished retirees for today's program. Please welcome John Olmschneider. Thank you so much, Sakina, and it's wonderful to have everyone join us today for this program. Um, I'm delighted, and I'm delighted to have all of you here to celebrate and to explore uh, the new book by Dr. Eugene Trani and Dr. John Nebo, Fulfilling the Promise, Virginia Commonwealth University and the City of Richmond, 1968-2009. Um, I'm honored to introduce our authors today, but I have to say that um, we could not have better people to chronicle the history of Virginia Commonwealth University than these two. Dr. John Kneebone is Associate Professor Emeritus of History at Virginia Commonwealth University. He is the author of Southern Liberal Journalists and the Issue of Race 1920-1944 and co-editor of the Dictionary of Virginia Biography Project. During his tenure at Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. Kneebone coordinated the public history component of our history graduate program and he served two terms as chair of the department and in 2009 received one of the university's most distinguished recognitions, the university's distinguished faculty award of excellence. He is currently working on a new book, Robert Stiles' Civil Wars, a fascinating biography of an intriguing Confederate memoirist. Dr. Eugene Trani is a person most of us don't need introduction to. President Emeritus and University Distinguished Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. After becoming VCU's president in 1990, Dr. Trani greatly expanded the presence of the university, leading VCU to play a key role in the metropolitan and statewide development and growing its national presence as a major urban university. I, I think all of us will agree, it's no exaggeration to say that Dr. Trani brought our university to maturity, and truly launched VCU into the national prominence that it enjoys today. After nearly two decades serving as president of Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. Tani retired from his presidency in 2009. Among other books, he is co-author of The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, Harrison Salisbury in the New York Times. After our discussion today, I know um, many of you, I'm sure many of you will want to go and purchase a copy of Fulfilling the Promise. Be sure and look it up. If you don't have a copy, um, you will be motivated to get a copy as soon as I tell you what our authors have today have uh, generously directed that all the proceeds for the sale will go to VCU Foundation to support scholarships for students. So buy a book, support a student, you'll learn a lot and you'll do a lot for Virginia Commonwealth University students as well. Um, and I can assure you, all of you, that once your books are delivered, you will find yourself with a wonderfully engrossing read. As Dr. Trani and Dr. Nebo make clear in the introduction, from its very first pages, this book departs completely from what they describe as, the, as quote, the custom of aging professors writing celebratory history of their local campuses. This book ain't that. You'll find celebrated names and you'll find important episodes and you'll find lots of amusing stories from the history of VCU. Uh, and you can be certain that you'll enjoy all of those. But as Senator Tim Kaine writes in his insightful foreword, the story that Fulfilling Promise tells about VCU is, as Senator Kaine says, multiple story, how two institutions became one, how that institution has interacted with state government, and how that institution has collaborated with and engaged with its home city to lift our entire region. Senator Kaine writes that the story of VCU is quote, an exemplary story of how an urban university strives, struggles, and succeeds in its quest to educate young people and contribute to the broader economic and cultural life of an entire metropolitan region. So folks, this is no ordinary history. You will find many threads of the history of Richmond and Central Virginia woven into uh, the tale of Virginia Commonwealth University. I know that I learned a great deal about Richmond and Central Virginia that I was glad to know, and I know you will too. The book falls roughly into two sections. 
the history of Virginia Commonwealth University before Dr. Eugene Chani joined the university in 1990, and the history after his arrival from 1990 through 2009. So I thought we might start off this session by asking Dr. Nebone to tell us a little bit about the first part of the book, and then hearing from Dr. Trani himself about the chapters covering his presidency. So John, uh, would you like to start off by telling us a little bit about Virginia Commonwealth University before 1990? Sure, thank you, John. Um, thank you everybody for being here. And I should preface this by saying that one of the highlights of the research for this book was sitting down to a full interview with Grace Harris about her career at VCU. Um, VCU, as we explained in the book, came about as a result of a political process. Both the successor institute, predecessor institutions, Medical College of Virginia and Richmond Professional Institute uh, were on their own tracks, uh, ambitious tracks, but neither had in mind merger with the other. The medical college was an independent medical school, that is, without a university affiliation, and as such, had become an outlier amongst medical schools in the United States. And in its efforts to keep up by moving the full-time faculty to ambitious research programs, found itself at something of a disadvantage uh, competing with other medical schools with their uh, larger university affiliations. The Richmond Professional Institute uh, had separated from being under the wing of William and Mary in the early 1960s and had in mind to become a proper university, which uh, to their mind meant uh, building up the liberal arts since it was already a professional school, school of arts, school of business, school of social work, uh, and so on. The political process came about out of the shambles of massive resistance in Virginia, the attempt to um, prevent desegregation of schools by doing away with public education in Virginia. Uh, the collapse of this, the subsequent collapse of the one-party bird organization, emergence of two-party politics, and awareness that Virginia needed to modernize led to a study commission 1964, uh, to look at all of Virginia public higher education, led by Lloyd Campbell Byrd, who was a um, graduate of MCV and state senator from Chesterfield County. His particular interest was the community college system, which emerged from the um, study commission. Uh, the study commission looked at the city of Richmond and said it needed to have a proper university and proposed the merger of the two schools, Medical College and um, RPI. The issue for the medical school, at least for Dean Kinlow Nelson, was to make sure that what emerged would be a first-class institution. This could be beneficial to them. The professional school saw advantages as well. The issue became where should the school be? Traditionally, universities were located outside the cities. Uh, small towns be called like places where, where a character could be formed and uh, done so without the distractions of the big cities. Um, and at RPI, the argument, uh, of course, for the medical school remaining in the city was um, taken for granted because you needed access to the proper medical material. So it made sense for the medical campus to stay here. Uh, RPI people argued that they should stay as well because as an urban university, uh, Richmond Professional Institute, the new university um, could be as an urban university of service to the city of Richmond. We have to realize that in the mid 1960s, emerging awareness of an urban crisis nationally with suburbanization hollowing out central cities, uh, retail following people out uh, to the suburbs away from the cities, damaging tax bases. And in places like Southern cities, Richmond in particular, issues of political change uh, and particularly school desegregation going on had their effects. Compounding all of this uh, was that just as VCU came into being, in 1967, 68, 
you also had the emergence of counterculture and conflict over war in Vietnam, and the two conflict about desegregation. And the result was we merged two institutions that particularly at the medical school had become profoundly aware of their differences from that bunch of hippies up at the uh, Richmond Professional Institute um, and uh, the white-coated medical school versus the uh, countercultural um, RPI now uh, VCU campus resulted in the new school getting underway with our new president, first president, Warren Brand, who had come from Virginia Tech, a uh, chemist by trade, and Brand expected that it would be rather straightforward to bring the two campuses together, only to discover that he had walked right into a firestorm. The MCV Alumni Association sent out a poll to the members in 1968 asking what they thought about the merger, and overwhelmingly, they came back opposed to it. Everything he tried to do to centralize administration of this university ended up with opposition uh, from one campus or the other. Um, ultimately, the price he had to pay for getting state support to plan for a new hospital was to agree to a second provost at the medical campus and allowing the medical campus to operate rather independently uh, away from that. Um, Brandt often told people he felt like Noah on Noah's Ark. He had two of everything. He had two administrators to do this, two administrators to do that, and so on. And in frustration, he departed in 1974, replaced by a public administrator, Theodore Temple. Temple came from state government. He had previously been um, city manager at Danville, Virginia, was secretary of administration for Mills Godwin uh, and for um, Linwood Holton, uh, had a very good reputation, came to the university. Uh, reputation included the ability to um, make people get along with one another. Um, he worked hard to build up the school. And in the 1976 legislative session, BCU got next to nothing and was told that getting planning money for the new hospital was enough not to go further. Temple had in mind to redefine the university. Instead of urban university, he would define it as a comprehensive university, which is a formal designation. Um, and VCU was a comprehensive university, the only other universities in Virginia that could make that claim were Virginia Tech and University of Virginia. He would take this on the road to the people of Virginia, that there were three comprehensive universities in Virginia, and the third one needed their support. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack before he could get his campaign mounted. Uh, he was succeeded by an outsider, by Edmund Ackle. Ackle was a medical man, an MD, and a dental degree. He came from Southern California, a University of Southern California, an urban university, and arrived and said he had been misled. He had been told this was a research university, and it wasn't. And he was going to make every effort to upbuild uh, VCU as a research university. He was heavy-handed. He pushed. He overrode opposition. Uh, he managed to get a lot of the administrative um, operations centralized in a way that was efficient, cost benefit, benefits to the university, but he made a lot of enemies. And he also fought with students, which is not a good idea for university presidents to do. He got crossways with the student newspaper. Uh, and of course, they um, had printer's ink. They could come back with as much as they wanted to say about him and drove him crazy a bit. Uh, but as important, he got crossways with a neighborhood adjoining VCU, which was Oregon Hill. Uh, Oregon Hill to the south of VCU. And if you go back to the Wayne Commission's uh, original plan for VCU, the Wayne Commission had proposed that VCU would expand all the way south to the James River. This was the last glory days of urban renewal. Um, and the Wayne Commission ignored the fact that an existing neighborhood stood in the way of that expansion. Uh, they didn't reckon with just how hard people in Oregon Hill would fight. 
in the last years when President Ackle introduced a campus plan, a new campus master plan, particularly for the academic campus, today's Monroe Park campus. It was one that was gonna be surrounded with dormitories and parking decks on the outside, focused on the library with streets closed down, traffic eliminated, and in a sense, putting up walls to prevent it from being engaged with the city. A uh, time when things were tough in Richmond. Uh, Richmond was uh, seemingly in decline, one of those donut cities with thriving suburbs surrounding and emptying inner city. And when Dr. Trani got here in 1990, he faced um, neighborhoods all around this urban university in opposition to the university's plans. He faced a legislative delegation from Richmond opposed to the school's plans and the city in serious decline. Um, just after he arrived, the evening newspaper, the news leader closed and the downtown department stores closed. Downtown um, commercial district went dark just as he got here. And the local newspapers at the time raised the question, was VCU doomed to stagnate? Was Richmond doomed to stagnate? Was it in a downward spiral that it would never get out of? And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to the next segment. Thank you, John. Uh, a wonderful introduction to uh, the early history of Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, a wonderful way to lay, the, lay out the challenges facing Dr. Trani. Let me remind everyone in the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box anytime. You don't have to uh, wait for any particular time. And also right now sitting in the chat box is the link to purchase the book. So please feel free to go out and buy a copy as you're listening to Dr. Trani, who uh, will pick up the story at this point, Dr. Trani. 1990, you arrived at VCU with all these challenges that Dr. Nebo just outlined for you. Uh, I am pleased to be with you. And, uh, this is an honor for me uh, to have worked on this project with John Newbone and now uh, to have the book out. Uh, I arrived from the People's Republic of Madison, Wisconsin, which in fact was my third state capital in my academic career. I began teaching at Ohio State University in Columbus, the capital of Ohio. I then I uh, began my administrative career in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, with the University of Nebraska system, uh, and then moved to Madison, Wisconsin. So the feel of a university, uh, a capital city uh, in the surrounding area was something that was very interesting to me. But there were problems. We really did have two distinct campuses who believed that they were distinct. Uh, and uh, did not have an awful lot of programming together. In the very beginning, I recommended to the Board of Visitors and the Board of Visitors accepted my recommendation that we build a university-wide culture of a single university with multi-strong parts, two campuses. And what became the Monroe Park Campus, or what used to be called, by the way, the academic campus, and that really did tick off uh, the people uh, from the NCV campus uh, in NCV with multiple strong academic areas on both campuses, medicine, allied health, arts, social work, among others. Uh, but they did not have an awful lot going uh, with one another. Uh, the board also accepted my recommendation to stay in the city with our two campuses with no major branch campuses. We were going to work with Richmond and with the community uh, to build up Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, but to do that uh, on uh, the footprints expanded, hopefully, with our two campuses. The most important decision for the university was to grow. And we grew in 1990 from 21,764 students to 32,284 students in um, 2008. We remain and have remained an in-state largely institution. Our in-state population went from 19,700 
to 27,700. And the freshman class went from 1612 to 3724. So we more than doubled the freshman class. Uh, and uh, that was really important for Virginia Commonwealth University to give us a critical mass uh, uh, to really become that urban comprehensive research university with a major academic medical center uh, that we had talked about. So those were all very important decisions uh, for the Monroe Park campus. Uh, the, next, the next important decision for the Monroe Park campus was not to go into Oregon Hill, uh, not to go south, but rather to go north to Broad Street, which eventually led to the Siegel Center. And by moving east of Belvedere with both engineering and business uh, part of that. So there was a dramatic growth in the undergraduate population. Uh, an awful lot of students, particularly from Northern Virginia, who looked at Virginia Commonwealth University and liked what they saw. The most important academic decision for the Monroe Park campus was the establishment in cooperation with Virginia Tech of the School of Engineering, which now has went from 500 students uh, in its early training to over 2,000 students uh, with 100 faculty members. And that combination with VCU Life Sciences has brought about academic uh, interchanges uh, and programs between the MCV campus and the Monroe Park campus. So uh, that is really important uh, to have these two campuses working together in the College of Engineering, it's now the College of Engineering, uh, has mechanical and electrical, chemical and life science engineering, uh, life science and pharmaceutical engineering, plus biomedical engineering. So a major focus on relationships with the medical center, uh, as well as with traditional uh, high-tech engineering. Uh, in addition, there was a sense of entrepreneurialism uh, and that sense of entrepreneurialism uh, created what is the Wilder School. Uh, it grew out of uh, the Center for Public Policy, uh, which was established in my, uh, March of 1994, which eventually led to a PhD in public policy. Uh, and one of the major things recommended by the former dean and member of the Board of Visitors, Bob Wilsworth, was the hiring of Douglas Wilder after he completed his term as governor to become a professor at the university. Uh, he has remained a professor at the university and in fact uh, remained uh, at times as a professor uh, from 2005 to 2009 while he served uh, as mayor, the first elected mayor, the elected mayor. So uh, the Wilder School uh, another example of the entrepreneurialism is the brand school, which came out of the advertising community. That is now a major graduate program. So with the Wilder School, uh, the PhD programs that it now has with the School of Engineering, uh, we have been able to dramatically enhance uh, the production of doctoral degrees by joining the School of Education uh, programs in the College of Humanities and Sciences, building on the strength of the professional schools uh, of RPI uh, that have grown and blossomed with the School of Engineering. For the MCV campus, without any question, the most important decision came in the year 1996. Uh, when I first came to Richmond and would go down uh, to ask for money, it was always more money for indigent care. Uh, and what we needed and the hospital and clinics were a state budget code with no flexibility in hiring, no flexibility in contracting, and no flexibility in capital construction. Uh, and uh, with the support of Governor George Allen, uh, the MCV Hospital Authority was set up in 1996 uh, with its own board, but with a lot of overlap. 
the president, the vice president, or health scientist, five members of the board of visitors, but other board uh, members independently appointed by the governor, by the speaker of the house, and by the president uh, and the senate. In the year 2000, it became the VCU Health System Authority uh, with the addition of the Physicians Corporation. So you really have two corporations, Virginia Commonwealth University, which does all of the teaching and research on both campuses, uh, and VCU Health, uh, which does the clinical operations, including uh, the faculty members. So that was a very, very important decision. Uh, the most important physical decision uh, for the MCV campus was shutting 12th Street where Abraham Lincoln walked up uh, to go to the, new, uh, to the White House of the Confederacy. Uh, that has resulted uh, with su strong support from the city in building the Gateway Building, which became the new front door for the hospital that was eventually built and completed during the Waco year. Uh, so uh, shutting 12th Street and focusing on the clinical operation uh, made the hospital more accessible. Uh, so those are the important things in terms of the MCV campus. For the area around the MCV campus, another very important thing uh, was the building of the Virginia Biotechnology Research Park which began with two buildings uh, that the university uh, has supported and that led to uh, UNOS, uh, the state forensic side, the state laboratory, uh, all being located on what could today still be parking lots in the downtown area. So it really enhanced the medical center. And in fact, a couple of major research centers are still thrive today uh, residents from the Virginia Biotechnology Research Park. So what you are seeing in the years uh, is uh, enormous growth for VCU, the defining of its role, and one other thing uh, that brought people together uh, was in 2011, our basketball team, headed by Shaka Smart, who by the way wrote a dust jacket comment uh, for the book, uh, took VCU to the final four. Uh, and what that meant was uh, VCU clearly was reaching out to its student body, reaching out to its alums, reaching out to its community, and reaching out to the faculty and staff on the MCV campus. But this was something uh, that they should all be supporting. And they're nothing but uh, black and gold. Uh, shirts being worn downtown in the MCB campus. So I do not underestimate the uh, importance of the final four run. The importance over the years as basketball uh, I mean, very, very important. Uh, I uh, kept on making a statement, football not on my watch. You know, I'm a very damn graduate. I taught at Ohio State was an administrator at the University of Nebraska and at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but uh, we are concentrating on basketball. Uh, that's where we should be. So I think those are the important things I will end with the most embarrassing moment. The most embarrassing moment was the Board of Visitors generously has named the Life Sciences Building, which had a recent fire. Uh, Roof is now being repaired. Uh, and, and my wife, a retired nurse anesthetist, who gave up her practice uh, and has served 19 years as I did, uh, serving Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, the day that that uh, was supposedly dedicated was going to be in September of 2001, but obviously 9 11 was part of the dedication. And we were very fortunate to get the newly elected governor to come to the dedication that took place in November after he was elected. And I had one simple task to do. All I had to do was say, and now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the next governor of the Commonwealth, 
of Virginia, and I said, Mark Early, who was his opponent in the election. And without blinking an eye, uh, Governor elect Turner said, Thank you, President John Castine, for that wonderful introduction. A lot of people thought it was a setup. It wasn't a setup at all. It was a big blunder and a major embarrassment. I want to close, and I know I've gone on a little bit with this book. The cost is only $35. It's been handsomely published by the University of Virginia Press. Uh, as uh, John Lumsnyder said, it was a wonderful introduction. Um, uh, president by Senator Tim Kaine, and dust jacket comments by the Dean of the Wilder School, uh, which we appreciated, by Shaka Smart, by Roger Gregory, the Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of the Fourth Circuit, and the former Rector of the VCU Board of Visitors, by David Barbacci, and by President Emeritus John Castine of the University of Virginia. And I want to read what he said. For anyone who cares about Virginia, Richmond, VCU, and their people, this is the book. It rings true, yet it tells intensely personal experiences of the women and men who conceived and crafted a great university for the Commonwealth. And that is what Virginia Commonwealth University is, a great university for the Commonwealth. And it's built on the activities of many, many people, including Dr. Grace Harris, for whom the uh, Leadership Institute is named approaching its, uh, entering its 20 years. Uh, so the proceeds, the royalties from the book are coming to scholarships, and I urge you to go out and buy a book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Trani, and thank you for the background on how you tackled these uh, broad challenges with a strategic vision. And I hope that everyone from the Leadership Institute is paying attention to the, uh, the forming vision that drove decisions that happened. You know, I have a question, Dr. Trani and Dr. Nebone, that uh, isn't exactly addressed in the book, but it does speak um, to how, especially Dr. Trani, how you formed a vision of what Virginia Commonwealth University should be um, in Central Virginia and to our community. Um, one of the audience members in one of the previous uh, uh, presentations um, mentioned that it was his understanding that Temple University in Philadelphia was a model for the formation and development of, of VCU. Uh, and I can understand how that happened. I mean, superficially, superficially, Temple has this uncanny resemblance to VCU. It's in an urban setting. It has a major medical campus that's separated by a mile, a mile from the undergraduate campus. It's all organized around a street called Broad Street. Um, they're both uh, well-regarded well professional programs, state-related, and so on. Um, so, Dr. Nebo, could you talk a little bit about whether the people who created VCU had Temple University in mind? And then, Dr. Trani, could you talk a little bit about your vision for VCU and how it was nothing like what Temple University is? Thank you, John. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, when there was initial planning, uh, this is in state level at the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, um, planning for the new university, there was a consultant from Temple University brought to Virginia to help uh, the Wayne Commission with its thinking. And my speculation is that the head of the chef, State Council at the time, um, Prince Woodard, who later was president of Mary Washington, had come from Temple University and he had brought someone he knew there to come down to be an advisor. Um, there's no real evidence beyond the consultant being asked to come in that VCU was directly modeled on Temple University, although I do think um, that Temple existed, helped to tell people that VCU could exist successfully as well. Uh, but I think Dr. Trani would agree that in the long run, unexpectedly, it was probably the Ivy League school, University of Pennsylvania, that made a be better model, better fit uh, for the resemblance to VCU. But I'll leave that to Dr. Trani. Yes, uh, 
the two institutions I looked at very, very carefully in trying to figure out what was possible for VCU were the University of Pennsylvania, which is located in West Philadelphia, a major medical center uh, that is integrated uh, with uh, undergraduate and graduate programs, uh, and obviously uh, is a major research institution. Uh, headed by Judith Roden, who later became president of one of the major foundations uh, in the United States. And when she arrived, uh, the University of Pennsylvania was building buildings facing away from the street to interior courtyards. And she turned that around and said, nope, we're an urban university. Uh, we are going to have our buildings uh, be on the streets uh, and we're going to relate to the community. And what she pioneered were a whole bunch of things like higher West Philadelphia, higher uh, people from the community to work at the university. Uh, and we have emulated uh, some of those uh, practices. The second uh, university that I looked at, also a private university, was the University of California, Southern California. Uh, my first mentor uh, in administration at the University of Nebraska was Stephen Sample, who then became president of the University of Buffalo and spent 19 years as president uh, of the University of Southern California. And USC became a major player in Los Angeles. Uh, and as Steve Sample said, um, and I incorporated his book on leadership in the course of I taught in the Honors College for a number of years, that uh, no one is going to purchase USC and move it to Phoenix, Arizona. It is where it is, and it needs to work with its community, and it needs to be a magnet uh, for economic development. And clearly, those two examples of private universities, the public universities uh, that we looked at, the University of Alabama at Birmingham which was a merger of uh, the University of Alabama's medical center, uh, which was located um, in Birmingham, startup university. Um, it's had uh, some great successes. It's a major medical center, uh, but VCU, uh, I believe, is a much more comprehensive and integrated institution. And the other one was the University of South Florida, uh, which started on the suburbs on the edge of uh, Tampa uh, and has made major commitments to the downtown area. So those were the examples I used. University of Pennsylvania, uh, University of Southern California, to incorporate uh, what uh, they have done and could do and clearly setting up the health system allowed uh, the medical operations to become a lot more uh, cognizant uh, with great pride. I look at the Children's Hospital being built downtown, the new ACC that is being built downtown, the medical center has stabilized the whole area down there. Uh, the Monroe Park campus has been also. So those are the examples. Thank you, Dr. Charney. It's really helpful to, to know your overall shaky vision for, for the university. We had an interesting uh, question from um, an audience member um, that I think both um, Dr. Charney and Dr. Nebo might want to address. And um, this audience member says that in, in the era of massive resistance, um, the university hired upper administrators who were African-American, Murray DePillars, Grace Paris, Alvin Sexnayer, um, and this person wondered, is that an act Henry of Rome. a conscious act? Excuse me? Henry Rome. Henry Rome, yes. Yeah. And others. There were others. Um, and uh, this person says, is this a conscious and, and active response to the conditions of the time, to particularly uh, given VCU's founding period and in time of massive resistance? Um, was this an effort um, uh, to recognize the need to uh, promote uh, uh, equity and, and equality um, along with the mission of Virginia Commonwealth University as an open 
uh, urban university embracing its reason. Do Dr. Nebo, what do you think about that in the early era? And Dr. Trani, you were influential in hiring a lot of these people. I'd like to hear with you from you after that. Let me let me preface this by saying that uh, during massive resistance itself, <clears throat> famously Grace Harris applied to the School of Social Work, uh, which had admitted African American students in the early 1950s. <clears throat> the dean was fearful of admitting her, even though she was fully qualified, <clears throat> for fear of offending people in state government, and she ended up going to Boston University instead, um, ultimately coming back as a faculty member at um, BCU. RPI was <clears throat> quietly progressive. There were more African-American students, minority students at RPI than at any other non-Black institution in the state of Virginia at the time of the merger. Uh, I can't say that the medical school was particularly progressive, but uh, it was opening up as well. Uh, VCU has always been um, in advance, being pushed by students, faculty, uh, and administrators. But I, I think that in particular, the examples given in the question are people who were important administrators during Dr. Trani's administration. And so I think Dr. Trani could address some of that as well. Great. Well, certainly uh, they uh, were significant uh, people with great backgrounds uh, and deserve to be uh, appointed to their positions. In fact, Dr. Grace Harris uh, was uh, one of the first two appointments that I made. Uh, she became vice provost uh, and then became provost in 1993 uh, when Chuck Rook, uh, provost, went off to become president of Boise State University. Uh, twice, I what took sabbatical leaves of three and four months in 1995 and 1998, and Grace Harris became acting president. So you think of the voyage that she made from being turned down uh, to study at Virginia at uh, RPI, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, and then becoming acting president. Uh, she was an amazing person uh, and the Leadership Institute uh, is well served uh, by bearing her name. The Board of Visitors uh, set that up in May of 1990. Uh, so yeah, it was conscious. The other area that I think was really important uh, was uh, to hire minority contractors uh, to make sure uh, that there was minority participation uh, in uh, the major capital construction, which is over $2 billion, occurred while I was president. Uh, you can't have a quota, but you can set guidelines. Uh, and the guideline that we tried to adhere to was 20% with minority contractors. Uh, in the final area that I think uh, that there was major collaboration uh, was in fact uh, with the health system uh, because uh, eventually uh, Virginia Commonwealth University uh, set up a uh, primary care network with local physicians uh, where uh, they were paid uh, Medicaid-like uh, rates uh, for seeing patients uh, in that meant uh, that these patients could see uh, physicians nearby uh, and uh, stay out of the emergency room when they really didn't need to be in the emergency room. So the health system set up something called Virginia Coordinated Care to work with community physicians to see local patients for regular health care. So you have the appointment of significant administrators and faculty members. Uh, you have minority participation, and you have opening up uh, the minority position. Uh, so VCU is, from my mind, a model institution in terms of what it is trying to do by working with its community. 
Thank you, Dr. Shai and Dr. Kneebone. Uh, we have a, another interesting question I think speaks um, to the moment, to today, that I, I think you both can, can comment to. And uh, the question is that in recent, just in, you know, this the past, forgive me, past four years especially, um, there have been lots of doubts that are cast about higher education in general and higher education institutions and their detachment, so to speak, um, from real America and real people. Can you all speak a little bit to, to that, um, that perception? Um, and how do you tell the public, our supporters and policymakers about the difference that institutions of higher education make to society, um, especially in times, for instance, of a pandemic? <laughs> um, which, what kind of message can we send to counter the, the negative narratives drawing on the history of how VCU has grown over the years. Uh, Dr. Trani, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, yeah, uh, clearly uh, Virginia Commonwealth University has become a major bulwark of the regrowth of the city of Richmond and the metropolitan area. Uh, in fact, uh, the engineering school literally came from the business community. Uh, we wanted, uh, Virginia wanted the city of Richmond and the metropolitan area to be more competitive, to be able to attract uh, companies and employers to the Richmond metropolitan area. And so clearly, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University uh, uh, has played that major role. Uh, I think things are going to change some in instruction uh, uh, in the future, uh, but I, if we, when you say has Virginia Commonwealth University made a difference? Just go downtown Richmond and look at the NCB campus and look at the Monterey Park campus. And you can see uh, the difference that VCU has made. John Lebo, your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are simply that if you were to walk around the campus at VCU before the pandemic, before everyone disappeared, uh, you would see the future of Virginia. And the future of Virginia looks to be awfully diverse um, and from a variety of different places in different directions. And um, VCU, like other institutions of higher education, is exemplary in that uh, it does make possible the people who are going to be our leaders in the future, um, providing opportunities for them to get a start and to move forward. And I think that um, attacks on higher education are misguided, they're politically motivated and folks who are within higher education are certainly capable of harsh self-criticism, um, which we apply regularly. Uh, but I'm much more optimistic given the long record of VCU's resilience and ability to adapt to circumstances that uh, VCU and higher education are going to come out ahead in the future. Thank you both. And, and um, there's no question that, of course, that VCU has reshaped Central Virginia. But I just want to add on my own that VCU has also, in many ways, reshaped the nation um, with the contributions of, of its graduates and its research programs um, to, to the well-being of people uh, everywhere in our country and the world. Um, John, I, I'd like to ask John to sort of change directions a little bit. Um, it is, it's fascinating over time, uh, the history up to 1990, to look at the evolution of the two cultures on the two campuses. And Dr. Trani referred to how over time um, he worked hard, very hard to bring them together um, and that it, even basketball made its contribution to that. But way back when, uh, you know, it was, there were pretty different places. There was the medical uh, culture, the health sciences culture, and then there was, uh, you know, the, the Gray Street Republic, right? Right. I wondered, yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and tell us a little bit about the Gray Street Republic. All right, it was actually the Grove Avenue Republic. Grove, not Gray, yeah, Grove although, Avenue. Although Gray Street, Gray Street was the center of the counterculture. In Richmond, uh, long, long been where sort of the Bohemians gathered, partly because of closeness to the School of Arts, uh, part, partly the fan district, 
Um, but the Grove Avenue Republic was um, houses in the blocks on Grove Avenue, closest to the academic campus, where people were want to close the block off and turn on loud music and have parties with lots of beer and have the police come and gather people and run them away. Um, most notoriously was an episode in October 1970 when Allen Ginsberg, the poet, was speaking and chanting at um, and reading at the uh, Franklin Street gym and someone handed him a note which he then read to the audience that there was a party at Grove Avenue Republic with free beer, which of course brought plenty of people. Uh, enough that the police, and the police were in the habit of rousting um, students and countercultural types anyway, um, that they arrived, began arresting people. Warren Brandt, President Warren Brandt recalled rushing over there and being outside one of the houses when the police arrived, everyone went inside and the crowd, in effect, picked him up and carried him through the house, out the back door, to the backyard. Uh, multiple arrests. Well, obviously, this um, didn't look like the most responsible sort of place uh, if you were down at the medical campus. Uh, but in truth, the leaders of the Grove Avenue Republic were part of the on-campus debates and discussions that kept classes going at VCU during the um, strikes that were happening cross country earlier that year after Kent State. Um, so that they, they did have some responsibilities there as well. Um, time took its toll, but uh, I think partly also it was the uh, spread of the counterculture that uh, as uh, Lee Zacharias, a novelist product of the uh, English department said that you couldn't tell the young Republicans from the Students for Democratic Society anymore. They all dressed alike anyway. And what people began looking for was the evidence, and there's plenty of evidence on the campus of students who were dressed perfectly business-like because they were taking classes and they were off to work after classes were over. They were coming from work or to the other classes. And so uh, to an extent, there's really truth that this was the countercultural university. And if you went to the University of Richmond or William & Mary, you uh, may make a road trip to get away from the stifling environment where you were. Um, but that, in fact, there was a good deal more complexity and a lot more discipline on both campuses than reputation might have had. Well, Dr. Trani, I don't think you ever got uh, hoisted up on the students, uh, shoulders of students and carried through the student commons, but um, you made a, a, such an important difference in bringing the two cultures together. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I just think we're a university now. We were not founded as a university. And the University of Richmond was founded as a university and had natural parts, the University of Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech. And we were founded as a collection of professional schools on both campuses. And I think there is now a culture of Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, people are proud of the university, proud of what uh, has been accomplished over the years. Uh, and I just couldn't be more proud uh, of the small role that I played uh, in trying to bring the two campuses together. Uh, and Buy the book. The money goes, the royalties all go to student scholarship and the VCU Foundation. Thank you very much. A perfect note to wrap up on the unity of our university that wasn't guaranteed in the beginning. And remember, you can learn all about it in the book. So I hope that you'll go out and buy a copy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My thanks to Dr. Trani and Dr. Nevon for helping to illuminate and amplify important parts of the book. And everyone, stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you again, Dr. Trani, Dr. Nebone, Mr. Ohm Schneider, Dean Gooden, and Dr. Douglas Glenn for this incredible discussion and session. Um, also, uh, a wonderful thank you uh, to all of our participants for today's session, including those questions that were asked. 
if you are interested again, and I will emphasize in purchasing Fulfilling the Promise, a link has been shared in the chat, and I'm also going to share that, as well as all the links that were shared during this presentation uh, in a follow-up email to all of our participants and registrants for this session. We hope you will also choose to complete these survey evaluation about today's session for our own feedback. And this also includes suggestions for future topics for upcoming Wilder School alumni lunch and learns that will be occurring. Um, a recording of the session also has been taking place. Uh, so it will be made available on the Wilder School YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we'll also share this in the same email that I will send uh, to all participants. Our next session uh, will be on Wednesday, February the 17th at noon. So mark your calendar, save the date. Um, and our featured speaker will be Dr. William Spriggs, Professor of Economics for Howard University and Chief Economist at AFL-CIO with a discussion about the economic recovery and the pandemic, followed by a Q&A session with our participants. Thank you again so much to all of you for joining us and we will see you in February. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.